I'll just uh, chuck everyone on mute. All right. Good morning. Still got people piling in as they do through the uh, through the late uh, seven teens and seven twenties. But uh, great to see all everyone online. Sh special shout out to a couple of the Queenslanders who were online uh, just after six a.m. this morning. Not obviously didn't catch the memo that we'd pop back to. Uh, daylight saving time or not daylight saving time. So uh, you know, Andrew was just, Andrew Denton was just telling a couple of us beforehand, he had a, 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 I guess, a speaking engagement on Zoom to Hillsong South Africa, which was at 4.30 this morning, which Andrew regularly does now. Now that he's not traveling, he's traveling around the world digitally at crazy hours of the morning. And he said it was at 4.30, but he was asleep in bed and his phone started ringing at 3.30 and that gave him a call said, where are you? Yeah, and they had forgot that it was it was going to be flicking back. So uh, I'm sure it was a manic, uh, quick rush to get ready and jump on. But uh, Andrew, as always, I'm sure it was really impacting. Uh, but yeah, really great to see everyone. And um, thank you for gathering again. Uh, always value these times and always value you guys that gather with us. Uh, shout out to Paulie McMillan in Darwin. They just, Paul and Wei Ling, just celebrated five years of business in their dental practice up there. So uh, thrilled for you guys. So you did a great dinner with your staff and team. And uh, well done, mate. You guys are awesome. And I can't wait to, Paul and I have become friends on basically over on this platform over the last year. And I cannot wait to hang out with him in the Hunter Valley in two and a half weeks. So he's come down for Kingdom Builders Retreat. So very cool, mate. Um, Hey, something we're going to start doing. Well, I mean, I often get comments about just the depth and breadth of people we have in our church. I've sort of taken it on as a bit of a challenge to, to really dive into some of that depth with who I ask to share on these platforms. And we just have so many seasoned business people and seasoned, not just business people, actually, seasoned people of faith who, uh, who just apply that faith to their, to their lives, to their families, to their careers, to their businesses. And I, I know I've found it extremely um like inspiring, I get so much feedback. I know you guys have too, but um, started really had on my heart recently to just be looking for some of the absolute young guns and just, I guess, getting to know some of the young guns in our world. I mean, we all know there's a lot of, a lot of you know, seasoned people doing great things and we're aware of a lot of them. A lot of us might not be as aware of some of the young people who are doing exceptional things. And I'm fortunate enough, I, operating in the financial stewardship space, I, you know, I get to occasionally meet some of these people. I want to meet more of them, but really uh, just get so passionate when I just see young people. Um, and I'm still classifying myself as a young person, 37 years of age, but I uh, love just seeing our young people killing it. And someone I had heard about for quite a while and, um, and I actually asked for an introduction. I, my, my neighbor works for this person and was, has been telling me about them for, for a little while. And, uh, and I asked one of our youth pastors, I said, hey, I want you to introduce me to this person. I just hear great things about her. And uh, we had the opportunity to connect on the phone this week and have a great chat. And that's uh, Christy Brisbane, who's jumped in. Christy, do you want to jump off mute? Just say a quick hello so you pop, pop up on everyone's screens there. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you all. Nice to, nice to see you. And I'm sure uh, everyone would, would agree. It's, it's great to have you on. Um, yeah, love, love chatting to you this week, Christy, and love hearing about what you do. Maybe for the benefit of everyone else, do you just want to, I guess, introduce us to you, give us a bit of context to who you are and what you do? Sure, I'd love to. Um, well, firstly, I think I'd talk about church. I've grown up my entire life in Hillsong, so I've been surrounded by amazing leaders and um, pastors with vision. Uh, it's always pushed me to try things that other people aren't doing. Um, so last year in the middle of covid I started a housekeeping and home organization business purely to just help the people in our community that don't have time to take care of all their household tasks themselves. Um, so now we've grown um, like crazy. I honestly thought it would just be myself for quite a few years whilst I finished uni, but we have a team of 10 or 12 now. We're just in the middle of hiring a few extras this week. Um, but we, we're just in the hills and there's so much demand for our service, quite a few points of differentiation. And, and it's just been crazy to see um, the response to a young one trying to get a foot in the door in the industry. So it's been really cool. Um, and I'm excited to see where 
where this connection and this connect grows to as well. Yeah, very cool. And um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's incredible, incredible growth. You were, you were talking to me a little bit. What, uh, what do you find that like, you're more, yeah, you're more than just, I guess, a, a cleaning business. Um, you did mention the organization, but what, what are some of the things that dis distinguish you guys? Because you yeah. had, a, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to jump in and hopefully I'm not answering it for you, but you, you just mentioned to me like there's been a huge demand for, for your services and word of mouth is spreading. You said you're seeing it pop up on Facebook. People you don't even know who they are recommending you. Um, so, yeah, mate, could you maybe let us know a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. Um, I think speaking to some of our clients and people who've, you know, they, they use the word, oh, my gosh, I finally found someone who's perfect. Um, you know, you do everything that we've been looking for because most people that have a cleaner, they, they just come in, they clean the bathrooms, they clean the kitchen, they do the floors and they come out and, and you know, they'll come once or, or once a fortnight or a week. Um, but we go the, a little bit extra. Um, we have some clients that, you know, we're going to three or four times a week, um, doing all their laundry, tidying up after their kids, changing bed sheets. So it's really more than just cleaning. Um, it's, really like we've become part of their family and we're just helping them to to go out and do what they want to do and spend more time with their family and things like that so that's probably the biggest point of differentiation but I mean um, you can probably tell I'm very easy to communicate with as well and people love that in the industry um, there's quite a few where you know they they send someone different every week we send the same person every week so you get to create a relationship with with our staff and um yeah, I feel like we just go the extra mile to make sure that, that their houses are taken care of and their families um, are able to function a little bit better. So good. What, what's been your biggest practical challenge in business so far or, or at the moment? What, what are some of your, um, what's a roadblock for you? Yeah, probably the biggest challenge is just finding good, reliable staff that want to work. Um, we have a few good ones now, but it has been challenging trying to find people who stick around for longer than a month or two, um, you know, not because of the work, but because cleaning and, and housekeeping, this sort of thing is often a stepping stone job for people. So we've, we've been able to, you know, say goodbye to people and wish them into like their dream career job, but it's sad as well. So finding people um, to do the work is probably the biggest challenge. Yeah, love that. I love what you said before, because I think it's, as as a client, as a customer, you're inviting someone into your sacred space, your home. And I just think that trust and, and even that consistency of the same person come in and, and the warm, easy service and communication, I just think is, is such such a benefit. And you were, tell us just briefly about the products you use. Yeah, so instead of using chemicals that are packed full of all the nasties, we use all low tox, um, chemical free cleaning alternative so it's um you're getting the same result but without the smell of bleach lingering for days and um, <laughs> and young families love that because little kids like to lick everything <laughs> yeah definitely definitely well I, I see here there's uh there's someone uh, someone saying hey we need you up in darwin something someone else said uh do you have team in noosa um uh, christy if there was one thing this group could help you with help you do what would that be um, I don't know, maybe just encourage me to keep going and stay faithful through all the challenges. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not even a year into this journey and the growth's been crazy. So to think about what it could be in 10, 20 years and, and not just with this business, but with other ventures too, mm -hmm. just to have a group of people who are cheering you on and um, a group of people that I can cheer on to, that'd probably be the biggest thing for me. So good. Well, I, I did drop your URL in the chat, but you've been getting a lot of encouragement. It's sort of pushed up the feed a little bit. Um, if people want to find you, what's the easiest way to, to find you or find you guys? We're pretty much on every platform, um, but probably through our website. I reply to the website inquiries a little bit better than social media and things like that. But we're everywhere. You can have a look at some of our before and after photos. They're pretty satisfying. Um, yeah, no, thanks so much, Dan, for the invite. Um, to come and, and jump on. I really look forward to these um, these things every week. Well, look, I think I can speak for behalf of a lot of people on here. We, we're inspired by what you're doing and we wanna help. So um, if you hit roadblocks, uh, make sure you're letting us know even practically if there's things you need in regards to your supply chain or you know whatever you might need. I know there's a lot of uh, very accomplished people in here that would 
it would be an absolute blessing for them to be able to help. So, um, yeah, so we look forward to uh, continuing to cheer you on and support you in the journey, Christy. Thanks, Dan and everyone. <laughs> Pleasure. Pleasure. Well, uh, isn't she incredible? And uh, I see you guys. Yes, uh, someone said, are they on social media? All sorts sorted. Um, if you did, I did pop it uh, in the chat a couple of times, the uh, URL, but all sorts sorted. Um, yeah, great, great business, doing great things. And uh, yeah, pretty cool, hey? Well, a uh, person I've asked to share this morning is someone who, uh, my wife, Christy, and I, my, Christy, my wife's name is also Christy, uh, with an I, K-R-I-S-T-I, so very close. In fact, when Paul, sorry, but when Paul Calloway was, I was giving you your d details, I was like typing your name and I said to Paul, is it C-H-R-I-S? And he was like, no, K. And I was like, why did I even say that? Because my wife's name starts with a K. Anyway, Christy things. Um, anyway, my wife, Christy, and I, uh, when Christy, she passed in Frontline uh, at our Hills campus, and we got to know a couple, an incredible couple that at the time were pastoring and leading Frontline at our Newcastle campus. And I remember the first time I met these guys actually over at our place in Castle Hill, and we were having a barbecue out on the deck. And I remember having a great chat to to this particular individual, his name is Hugh. And I was like, gee, Hugh is just a cool guy. Like he just knows a lot of really cool stuff. And I actually remember at a time, I think we were talking about uh, possibly like rammed earth uh, construction and some things like that. And he was just such an intriguing, interesting guy. And that has been my continual experience with Hugh. I absolutely uh, love a chat with him. I always just leave better person. I always leave uh, feeling like I've just gained useful, helpful, and interesting information. Um, and it's just a pleasure. He's an absolute humble guy. Uh, he's, he's an incredibly, um, incredibly uh, like great operator in what he does. I remember we, we uh, shared some facility, uh, like some accommodation. And at last, I think it was Kingdom Builders Retreat, and he had to work one of the days. And I just saw him in work mode. And I was like, intimidated and like inspired at the same time, just watching him operate. Um, he's just, just such, such a great guy, but uh, someone who I, I just think is gonna, who is not only a great business guy, he's a great man of faith, raising a great family, uh, key kingdom builders in our church and just, just an all around blessing. I know you guys are gonna be as, uh, as blessed as I am uh, having the opportunity to receive off Hugh Thompson this morning. So Hugh, welcome, mate. We're absolutely honored to have you. I know you are part of this group, but uh, honored to have you sharing this morning. So thank you for being with us. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, Dan. Um, welcome, everyone. Good to see you all. And uh, certainly many familiar faces from Hills and, and Newcastle, certainly names popping up. So good to see you and many of the other campuses that I've, I've been to. Just a quick thing for me, I, I do just want to honour uh, Dan and Christy. I, I think, uh, you know, before they got big and famous running Business Connect, uh, th th they always have had a heart for people. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's inflating to say uh, the, the young adults pastors. And we did, Lauren, my wife and I ran uh, pastor in Newcastle for uh, you know, around 10 years with youth and young adults and a few different other things. But, but uh, you know, always inspired when, when, when big wigs like Dan and Christy have a, have a genuine commitment to the, to the people. And you always find Dan in, a, in the corner of a room or wherever it might be, having a conversation to someone who's not famous and he's just building them up, lifting them up and, that, that's such a genuine pastoral thing. So I, I just want to honour you. A couple of other quick shout outs from an honouring perspective. Obviously, Brian and Bobby, um, as I started, you know, Dan gave me a call like I suspect he does with a few people and said, hey, have a chat about what's on your heart. And as I flicked through my journals, it's just littered with comments from Brian and Bobby that, that have been absolute, uh, you know, obviously behind the Bible, uh, but, but, but theological cornerstones to a, a, a life and, and a, a life that's been up and down with a whole lot of turmoil and a whole lot of success, but, but uh, built on so many great principles. So I can't go too far without honouring them. And two others just quickly before I move on. Um, Andrew Denton, shout out to you. You are a absolute champion and a pillar. Um, my wife and I pull in behind Kingdom Builders, as I'm sure many people do on this call. And uh, I know that you lead that with... Um, great passion and, and when I say lead I don't mean you know what I mean by lead you, you lead it in spirit and in charge and it's someone that's just out the front at a hands-on context of out there running so I just want to honour you because I think everything the platform we're looking at and building on 
is largely work and seeds that you sowed well before I knew what Kingdom Builders was. So um, just a big shout out to you. And the last one for me is probably someone who's on these calls regularly, and I'm not sure whether he's spoken much or otherwise, but he's a super humble guy himself and, and has built his own business empire. Really, really um, inspiring for me. Someone I've watched over a very, very long time uh, who inspired me with a lot of things, and that's Mark Rooney. Uh, so shout out to Mark. Um, he, he's taught me a lot of things, one of which comes from, I think, a, a family legacy piece about um, the importance of what, when the Bible says laying up an inheritance for, for a wise man lays up an inheritance for his children's children. And that just puts perspective around all of our commercial efforts, all of our financial dreams and ambitions and, and the way we live, that we're actually laying an inheritance financial and, and a spiritual legacy. Um, so a big shout out to Mark. And of course, um, the thing I need to honour him most for is uh, when he said yes for when I asked his, for his daughter's hand in marriage. So um, a, a big shout out to Mark. But um, just quickly pray and then then perhaps we can get into a few things. Father, we come and thank you for this opportunity to come together. Lord, I pray that you just guide us, lead us. Uh, let the rubbish that I say fall away and let the good things stay. Um, we honour you. We thank you for your goodness to us. You're always faithful. Uh, amen. So I thought today we've only got a few minutes and I just wanted to probably just run over a quick um, introduction to myself and a little bit about my professional leadership stuff that, uh, you know, again, I hope whatever sticks needs to. And then just a bit of a faith perspective, because I genuinely believe and I tell it in a secular work environment, I can say a whole lot of stuff to you about my leadership perspectives and my professional viewpoints. But at the end of the day, if it's not underpinned by a, a theological and a spiritual foundation, uh, so much of that is just built on sand. So. Uh, I need to be clear on that. I'll probably say just before I get in too far, my father has made a lot of mistakes in his life, but one of the good things he said to me and he taught me about was what he called the KFC theory. And when you go to KFC, which I don't regularly, but if you do, uh, and I'm sure this will resonate, uh, you might order your box of chicken and, and the chicken's really tasty, but there's going to be bones you have to throw away. And today's one of those things. And I believe it. The only, the only thing where you're not throwing away bones is when you read the Bible. It is the only infallible source. And whether you're listening to a pastor, a leader, a guru, reading a self-help book, whatever it is, there's always bones you've got to throw away. So use the KOC theory today. If something I say doesn't resonate with you, don't get upset by it. Just throw it away. Uh, and if there's something that's connected to the word of God, then I trust you'll put some, uh, put some weight behind it. But look, my, my story, just to start, is a humble one. I was born in a small town in New Zealand and grew up to parents that didn't have a whole lot. They followed the call of God when I was seven years old over to Perth to plant a church. They passed it for 20 odd years. Um, and that's the environment that I grew up in, not having a whole lot of resource. I got lucky uh, with, uh, with sports. I'm pretty tall for those of you that come to Hills Campus. You'll probably <laughs> know I, I, had a, I have a height advantage, which allows me to succeed in one or two sports. And um, that was probably the only, certainly wasn't coordination or athleticism or talent. Uh, but, but that was um, a, a good thing for me that let me go to the US. So I lived over there in Houston and Texas and played from Hawaii to Puerto Rico uh, and north to south with sports for a couple of years doing that. And that was just amazing exposure to some of the world's best leaders like Kofi Annan, Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, presidents past and former. Uh, exposure that I, as a young kid coming out of a town of 25,000 in New Zealand could have never ever dreamed of. So, um, you know, amazing story. God just opened doors. Uh, when I came back to Perth uh, after a couple of years of doing that, I couldn't play in the NBA, care of that lack of talent that I mentioned. <laughs> so Dan and I now watch it on TV along with many of you, I'm sure. But uh, I came back to Perth. I studied law. I practiced law for a while, but um, I like to say at the turn of the millennia, it makes me feel old. I moved, uh, you know, not long after that, moved over to Newcastle uh, where I met my wife. I moved there for professional reasons. I didn't know a single person as a guy who grew up in substantively in Perth, um, uh, didn't know a single person and, and went for a job interview in Sydney and just didn't feel it was right. And they said, this law firm said, hey, we've got an office in Sydney, in Newcastle. Why don't you go and have a look up there? So I did. And as I was waiting for the hour or two before that uh, interview, I walked into a church right on the main road of Newcastle there, which is now Hillsong, Newcastle. And I just said to the lady at reception, do you mind if I come in and pray just for a little bit? And I felt God say to me there and then, this will be your church. And uh, gave me great comfort, obviously, going into an interview. <laughs> and lo and behold, it was home for 15 years. I met my wife there. We had our kids there uh, and, and so many great uh, friends and family. So that's my story. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a lawyer by training. Uh, don't hold that against me. And for those other lawyers that have um, been on the 
uh, Business Connect previously. I, I certainly uh, inspired by your passion for it. It wasn't wasn't right for me. So I worked for six or seven years in a large private practice doing uh, mergers and acquisitions and corporate advisory. I worked for big businesses and small businesses. And I saw, I guess, a whole raft of different people and everyone from the courageous out there, self-starter that's made a mozza to the conservative big uh, corporates and, and worked the whole, whole spectrum of it. So I really enjoyed uh, firstly, for me, as someone who's not a perfectionist, I'm a fast moving, um, I like to get things done and I'm not really too concerned of how perfect it is. Uh, law for me was something that just required me to really turn my mind to being precise and learning a craft and just doing enough to be really good at what you do, even though personality wise, it wasn't perfect for me. So, uh, and it gave me a great foundation. So I'm always indebted to that. We're, part of this little side plays and all this is pastoring youth and young adults worship team, creative team, always serving in the house. Uh, we're very blessed that uh, when we had kids, my wife basically has been working for the church and now works at Hills um, in events team. She's an accountant by profession, gave up that career when we had kids. So I'm indebted for that. Um, but where we sit now um, uh, is in Hills. About three or four years ago, we moved uh, down. I was just doing more and more time in Sydney and more time on the road traveling. So. Uh, it made sense to move our family down before the kids hit school and, and we've just loved it. It's become home. Uh, it's everything we do. So in terms of what I've been doing for the last 10 or 15 years now, is running large construction companies, civil engineering, uh, building everything from roads and bridges and railway stations to big water assets. And that's my role now, primarily almost exclusively in water. So uh, it's one of the things you probably don't think about a whole lot. Um, but I like to say we save more lives than doctors and dentists combined. Not that dentists save lives, but it just makes it sound bigger. <laughs> uh, but it, I genuinely believe it. it. When you see and you get involved in organisations like WaterAid and others, and you realise the importance of clean drinking water, and when communities don't have clean drinking water, and when people don't have sanitation, and I think about places in Africa and Asia where, and, and it really strikes home, you know, teenage girls have to go to, communal pits where people go to the bathroom to deal with their menstruation and things like that. And what we have as a first world, take it for granted every day you get up, uh, we, we, we just take it for granted. So I like to think that when we play in the water game, it's an asset that people don't see. It's all underground. No one sees the pipes, no one sees the pump stations, the treatment plants are hidden from sight. But every time you turn on a tap or flash a toilet, it's an everyday activity that just brings people health. So uh, I like to inspire people with that. That's why we do what we do. Um, but in terms of the size of the business, give you an idea, um, I've spent the last couple of years running businesses that are sort of three, four, 500 people, uh, 350, 400, 450 million a year sort of revenue, um, as well as sitting on a number of uh, boards. So I chair uh, the Sydney Water Partnering for Success uh, Southern Region, which is about a $4 billion capital works program uh, over 10 years. Um, uh, and a number up in Queensland. So it's everything from putting pipes in the ground, really agricultural sort of, I'd say easy to do stuff. It's not easy, they shoot me, the guys that do it, but uh, to the more complex SCADA telem telemetry stuff. So every one of those pipes and every one of those valves has a little computer nozzle that does all the IT whiz bang stuff. I don't understand, but for some reason I, I am the uh, chair of those programs and a few others. So. Um, we have offices in my current role uh, from, I look after Echuca right on the border of Victoria, uh, Sydney and uh, New South Wales. We've got three offices in Sydney and then a couple of offices in Queensland also where I bump into Andrew Denton and a few others regularly at the airport lounge or whatever it might be. So uh, too much time on planes, but uh, that, that's the role. So um, a little bit of a side hustle too, inspired by the likes of Andrew and Mark and a few others I mentioned. Um, I certainly don't hold myself out as a property developer, but I, I do believe in following the prompting of faith and sometimes just a little bit of boldness and courage and, and stepping out. And, and God's blessed us in that way too. Uh, in a small side hustle, like don't overestimate it, but, you know, a little a little way to really support the kingdom. And, and that's certainly the, my brother and I who do it with, uh, my wife and his wife, legend and a family secret, my wife, uh, my brother married my wife's sister. So uh, we're you know, really close in that, in that regard. It makes family investments a little bit easy. Uh, but uh, uh, so we're but 
both really passionate for the kingdom. So it's been a good, a good, uh, a good avenue, and that's something that we've been able to do just by the prompting. But look, I thought with a couple of minutes we've got left, I just want to talk about professional and leadership lessons, and I'm going to fly through a few things, throw them out. If it resonates with you, it resonates, and then a few spiritual things that I think are just important. So. Um, I know we've got a few minutes. Let's go, shall we? Look, one of the things I think that's really important, and I'm happy to share a link, is organisational resilience. Um, you can build a business on personality, but building a business on platform is a totally different perspective. And there's a whole lot of work when it comes to organisational resilience that builds something that's bigger than an individual. And I don't know about you or your ambitions, but if you're building a business around uh, personality as opposed to platform and the shift and the, the switch of gear to change that is a massive step. So I, I want to just encourage you around the, 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 a key, couple of key metrics for me. And, and it hinges largely on what I think is accountability. So as you go through the organisational resilience framework, strategy is easy. Everyone loves to articulate a vision, throw it out there, people chase it, all that sort of stuff. The operational mandate, tactical plan, whatever you want to call it, like the, the way the steps you're going to get there, that's easy to some extent. I, I, I don't mean to trivialise it for those of you that might struggle with those times and lock yourselves away. But the real challenge comes in accountability and the ability to actually hold people accountable to what you're trying to do. And accountability, not in the context of, um, uh, you know, being outspoken or aggressive or harsh in a way that's uplifting, but that keeps people um, on track for what they're doing. And there's a number of white papers that have been written through organisationalresilience.gov.au. Feel free to have a look at that. The Government of Australia write white papers on organisational resilience because it's so fundamental to our business uh, and corporate world. I encourage you to check that out. And so much of it comes down to trust and the idea that no matter where you go in your organisation, you have to have trust. And trust is driven by accountability. When, when people know that others in an organisation aren't held to account, they start dropping the ball themselves. So I want to encourage you, like when you're talking about running multi-site or, or scaling up a business and growing something from what might be a, a two or three, where all of the employees might have connection with the owner or the leader or whatever it is, and you need to go from one layer to the next, it requires that ability and a real uh, skill set and learning how to have accountable conversations. And it still blows me away at how... Um, how uh, prevalent it is in the corporate world that people have those in a whole range of poor distorted ways passive aggressive type uh, super aggressive type uh, manipulation all ways that people think they're holding people accountable and it's just a big farce and you know as christian leaders i think we have to be the the absolute exemplar of what accountability is we walk with a humble authority that can sit someone down in love and say, hey, I think this is what's best for the business. And I think this is what's best for you and the team around you. So I want to encourage you if, you, if you want to look at leveling up your business, I reckon that'd be a big one for me. It's certainly a journey that I walked a number of years ago, really reading lots of books on it. And I think it's just a foundational point. And that probably leads into my second point around governance and growth and running multi-site operations. And again, a lot of people that I talk to, I get asked to have coffee with about how do you take something from being a single office you know, 30 or 40 people to multi-site and how do you not drop the ball and how do you keep it growing in that context? And so much of that relies on, on, on good governance and governance isn't some rocket science. Um, I, I used to, from a legal perspective, it, it became actually very simple and far more cultural than a structural thing, far more um, uh, in the spirit of the couple of leaders that needed to drive it than it was a, a systems piece. Systems are very, very important, don't get me wrong, but a couple of key call-outs, I'd say. One from a pastor, uh, Jeff Woodward, who's a good friend of mine in Perth. Um, firstly, prioritising purpose over preference. And any time that preference becomes the priority, you... you you, you empower individuals to make choices that suit their preference as opposed to the purpose. And as long as the purpose is understood and you're communicating that, preference has happened, don't get me wrong, but purpose always has to prevail over preference. And I think when you're running multi-site, that becomes more and more important, that people understand the purpose. Yeah, you can do it your way. We're not going to be looking over you every day. Uh, you know, we, we can't afford to look over you every over your shoulder because I'm just not in your office. But what I need to know is that you understand the purpose. Why is it we're doing what we're doing? And as long as you understand that and drive it, then your preference can be a little subset of what's going on. I don't mind. It adds value to our business with preferences. Like, I'm not putting a line through it. It just can't prevail over the purpose. And then the other thing for me, and this is a stickler, because I know there's some perfectionists on this call, my wife being one of them, um, progress over perfection. You know, like, I, 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 the more multi-site and the bigger we've got as a business, uh, it, it 
it dawned on me I'd regularly go to an office and someone would be stuck at their desk trying to get something right and they would have had to been hitting a roadblock for possibly weeks and weeks on end without raising it because they're just so worried about get, getting things right. And for me, progress over perfection and giving people confidence, and this is where empowering comes in, right? Giving people confidence just to make the call and, and drive on their own gut, their own instinct. We trust you, we back you, we know you're going to make mistakes, but I'm going to support you anyway. I prefer progress over perfection every day of the week. So uh, that's my personality. It's worked for me. It may not work for you. I'm not going to give that advice in a legal or an accounting firm. You probably need to get it right. Don't get me wrong. But or particularly a doctor, you know, like don't, don't yeah, get that perfect, please. But but you hear the spirit of what I'm saying, right? Like like it's really easy to get caught. I'd say this: being a perfectionist in a corporate environment is really easy and doesn't require courage. Making, making progress requires a hell of a lot of courage because you are required to make a call that sacrifices something for the expense of progress. So I'll just throw that out there as a thought. Probably leads into a couple of other thoughts quickly. Um, one I have written on my board because I think it's a great one. It's been there for years and years. Little hinges swing big doors. If you take notes, you can write that down. Little hinges swing big doors. Everyone loves big doors. I don't, we've got this, I made this barn door for my wife. She likes barn doors. We painted it this inky blue. Actually, Dan was admiring my craftsmanship the other day. But it, it's a really big door and it rolls on these two little rollers or maybe, you know, side swinging door, whatever it is, the little hinges. Everyone loves the big door, right? Everyone loves the big business, the big numbers, the whatever, the success, all that stuff. What we fail to often look at are what are the two or three hinges that are the necessary tension points that allow those to swing. And that door has to swing on those hinges. You can do all you want. You can lubricate it, you can keep it clean, but there's still an element of tension and pressure on those hinges. And I wanna encourage you when you look at your life when the door you're trying to swing, what are the acceptable tension points that you actually need to focus on to drive that door and allow it to swing freely? Because the tension points, I think we run away from naturally. We instinctively go, I don't like having to deal with that. But when you realize that that's the key to your success, that actually I need to confront, and we take on sometimes too many. I'm not talking about 10. I reckon tension points in a business, those, those couple of things that you focus on, whether it's HR related and driving systems improvement or whatever it might be, need to be a couple of things that you lubricate them as best as you can to stop them being squeaky, but they will always be a point of tension. And that's where we need to be really... Um, elite in having uh, really robust conversations. The, the day that a, a boardroom or a meeting when people come and sit in your office or whatever it might be, are just, you know, everyone's smooth and happy. Like it's, it's not healthy. Tension points necessarily require a whole lot of pressure. So I'd, I'd, I'd take it or leave it, do what you want to do. I, I don't have enough time to go probably to, but you, you can hope if it's got truth, go and research it on your own. Um, Key thing for me, and again, I'm just going through a couple of things I've pulled out of my journals. Um, uh, care for people and their dreams. You know, like, I don't care what business you're in. People have dreams and ambitions. And if the day we stop caring about other people's dreams and ambitions, we start failing. And people often ask me, how do you as a lawyer, training by, through law, run construction business? Like, what do you know about engineering? What do you know about bridge bearings and joists and how to swing? Cool stuff. Like, I'll give you an idea. Like, we... You know, we have um, we have big helicopters that lift up massive water valves into dams. We have big 450 ton cranes that lift little cranes down into like crevices to do their work and then go massive uh, four or 500 ton culverts when we cut a railway track and drop in. You can go to Sydney Olympic Park and have a look at it down near the Opal Tower that fell over. There's a big underpass with a 450 ton culvert. And I remember lifting that sucker in there with this 650 ton crane it was just the most amazing thing to watch like really really cool um but you, you at, at the end of all of the day the re reason i feel comfortable leading a business that has all that technical engineering stuff is because I, I i don't need to know it i've got great people and i trust them and i care for them and when i know and understand them and we have those great relationships i feel like i can lead because you're leading out of a place of relationship that actually allows the ultimate level of accountability Relationship is not the guys for lack of accountability. It's those guys for great, um, yeah, thanks for that, Liam. I haven't met you, but I like you already. Um, uh, closet engineer. <laughs> um, so I wanna encourage you, care for people. One of the things I think businesses do really crap, can I just say this, is um, 
when, when people leave our business, it's like generally they're out. One of the things that I've driven, maybe it's my time in the US, is I've always driven what I call the alumni culture. When someone comes in our doors, the onboarding experience has to be really good. They have to feel like they're part of it, that conversation, and maybe I'm stealing from Phil Camden here, who's a pastor up in Newcastle, for those of you that know him. The day you walk into our business, it changes forever. Like you are expected to make a difference. We didn't bring you in here just to be another person. We brought you in. Then they make their contribution. And when they finish their season, out they go. You know, I really want to drive a culture and I encourage you and your business, think about how you drive an alumni culture. Once you've done your season with us, you're always part of the family. Like you do get a few bad levers, don't get me wrong. I've had to beat people out that have done dodgy stuff or, you know, stolen IP or like been there, done that. But by and large, you're creating a team that when people leave, they actually speak highly of your business. They go, and I do, like at my previous roles, I was the chief operating officer for a company called Abigail, which is another 400 ish million dollars. And I regularly have drinks and lunch with, with the owner of that business, despite the fact that I left as, as his key guy. He lived in his castle over in Ireland. But I, I love that we can, I can leave a business and still have great rapport, great friendships. I want to encourage you to do the same thing, drive that sort of a culture. Um, and a couple of others, um, envy, and I'm speaking from my own weakness here. Um, comparison's the killer. Maybe it's too much of a youth pastor thing. I know it's always been said, but I see it in corporate world all the time too, you know, like we, we compare so much to the progress of others. And at the end of the day, if you're a Christian leader and you believe that God has ordained your steps, the only thing you're comparing yourself to is against God. And I want to encourage you, when, 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 you, when you let envy creep in or comparison creep in, it's actually a lack of faith. And it comes down to, do you trust God or not, that he is ordaining your steps? Because when he ordains your steps, the pace of those steps, the direction of those steps changes everything. And it's given me a lot of comfort. You know, Second Corinthians says, take every captive, um, take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. And, and I need to tell you, um, that's not a once-off affair. Like, I, I do that today and I did it 10 years ago and I did it 20 years ago and I still struggle. So I want to encourage you, you might, I mean, Paul talks about the thorn in his flesh, you know that, but but as a, as a corporate leader, I still have struggles. So I want to go, I've got to hustle. Sorry, Dan, I know I've got one minute, mate. Um, I'm going to drop all the rest of that. Ultimately, I believe you need to lead a business you're proud of. Can I talk about faith quickly? Um, God opens and shuts doors. Don't despise God's guidance. Keep a journal. I've still got a memorial stone here. The Bible talks in the Old Testament about 15 times about memorial stones. This is one I have and I've had for 20 years. No, not quite, 15, 16. I preached a sermon in Newcastle. I remember it was probably the first one I did and I put one of these little rocks on everyone's chair. And I wanna encourage you, if you don't keep a journal of the good things, the memorial stones that God's done, and I play with this every time I'm on a phone call, every time I'm in a board meeting online or whatever, and I just go, God, you've always been faithful. When our business was against its wall and about to shut its doors, you came through, you gave me a breakthrough. My wife and I remember it like, the late nights going into transport for New South Wales and other, get the memorial stone, stand on the word of God. Can I just prophesy over you quickly? And then I'm going to hand back to Dan because I'm late. There's two things I believe without a doubt. Psalm 66 verse 12 says, for surely God, you've brought me through the flood and the fire into a place of um, abundance. I don't know what your flood season is where you're just drowning and feel like I've only got one breath left. I don't know what your fire season is where you're so brittle, you've, it's just burned through. You know what I mean? Like just black and ashen and there's no green life. But God says, it's the promise of God, stand on his word, that through the flood and the fire into a place of abundance. So I want to just encourage you in that. And lastly, and it's generic as, but I, I got convicted when Brian, I, I got this word a year ago out of uh, Deuteronomy, that you know, Deuteronomy 28 says, you make it the head and not the tail, cause every, the work of your hands to prosper and will bless you. And I, I remember saying it was my, my I, I seek God every year for a little prophecy for our family and our connect groups and all that sort of stuff. I thought, God, this is just so generic. Like, this is not the right, this is this. And then within two weeks, I was standing in our, in our um, epicenter and Brian called me out, said, I've got a word for you in this typical voice. God will bless the work of your hands. And just prophesied straight out of it. And it was just so convicting that God, there's nothing cliche. There's nothing template. There's nothing whatever. It's a promise, divine promise of God. And no matter what you're doing, yeah, I remember it too, Dan. It makes me goosebumps right now. Um, no matter what you're doing, stand on the promise of God. You are a Christian leader before you are a corporate professional. You are a man or a woman of God and your identity is way more important in Christ than it ever will be. And your world will get pulled away. My wife and I, had, Lauren had to walk up care of my silliness in political life. You don't have to Google too far to find this. Uh, made some silly tracks, some silly decisions. 
but God is always faithful, even in our silliness. Deuteronomy 28, you remember that. So everyone loves that. 29 is when it goes wrong. You disobey God and he says, this will happen, blah, blah, blah. But even back then, Deuteronomy 30, but if you come back to me, I will bless you. I'll do this. So I want to leave you with that. I'm sorry to rush through. Dan, I thought I'd be a bit better on time, but five minutes left. Cheers, mate. You, mate. E exceptional. That was, uh, I feel like I need to remind everyone that we do record these and we do pop them on YouTube because I think there's a lot of people here that need to re just rewatch that. I'm, I think I'm, I'm saying that because I'm one of them. And there was just so much gold. I was hammering away on my phone, just taking notes and, um, mate, I definitely, you know, appreciate you respecting time, but, you know, as far as I was concerned, you're right, right on track and, um, appreciate it, mate. Thank you for just loading us with so much gold and so much information and, and uh, information is the wrong word, but uh, that really was an investment an impartation. I think, um, you know, wow, I, I'm, I'm inspired. I definitely feel, feel larger because of what you shared this morning. Thank you, Hugh. I was just going to do one thing. I was going to ask Byron Knowles. Byron, I just thought to ask you to unmute. Could you tell us what you loved about that? So I saw you putting some comments in the chat. Just unmute for us, Byron. Oh, oh, you'll still need to unmute. Sorry, mate. Yeah. Sorry, mate. Yeah. Now, listen, I loved everything about that, but there's so much about it that's so inspiring. You know, one of the best things about that was definitely you know, to, to make sure that you are focused on, you know, the, God's first, because we all have a tendency to get wrapped up in our corporate lives and in our business lives. It takes precedence because it, it, it demands all of your time and you can be easily focused on that and make God come second. I'll get back to God when I get done with this next step. And to put him first and everything is, is just huge and, be able, and to be able to take that in every decision that you make in knowing that sometimes the decisions put you in a place that's not comfortable, knowing that God is going to take you to the next level that will be comfortable, but only he's going to take you there is just so important. And I got that through this message a lot. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you, Byron. Hugh, I know you prayed at the outset. Uh, could you pray for us as you send us into our days and the rest of our week? Yeah, sure. Holy, Holy Spirit, I thank you. I, I pray that we'd just be more dependent on you, Father, that we, we would slow down enough amongst the busyness. And I'm so guilty of it, Lord, just to stop and just remember that you are God, that you are sovereign, that you all through our steps, you sway the hearts and minds of kings. So, Father, I pray today that you would just draw us to you, Holy Spirit, that your voice would be clear, you would grace us for this day, that you would cause doors to open and you would cause the doors to shut. I pray that you would help us. Uh, Lord, draw to remembrance the things in your word that we should stand on and practice today. Uh, I pray in Jesus' name. I thank you for every person here. Bless them. Keep them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you again, mate. Uh, yeah, greatly, greatly do appreciate you. And yeah, you guys as friends, as people would I admire and look up to. Yeah, just want to say thanks. Everyone, throw some encouragement on the on the chat for you. One thing I am just going to mention uh, as as we close is some of the some of the women, the girls are gathering this Saturday morning. If you want to be part of that, I have uh, also thrown the link under the chat. They're gathering in here in Sydney. So apologies for anyone that's not Sydney based, but uh, it's going to be a great morning. So mentioning that. Be blessed, everyone. Uh, appreciate you. Love you. We're here for you. And uh, yeah, wishing you the best. Close of your week. We'll see you in church on the weekend. See you, guys. Hey, thank you, Hugh. That was amazing, mate. That was so good. Like, um, yeah, right up there with some of the best we've heard over the last 12 months. So, yeah, brilliant, mate. Thank Jeez, you. Man. Appreciate it. Have a great day, everybody. Love you all. God bless.